Clap. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of The Carmudgeon Show. My name is Jason Camisa. That over there is Derek Tam hyphen Scott. This is part of the Haggerty Podcast Network. And today we're going to be talking about Stellantis, um, and the drug, and the car company, and British Leyland. Just the car company. <laughs> Could you imagine the lo- the drug, British Leyland? You would take it, it would and be not lethal. know whether it was an upper downer, it would kill you, whether cyanide or it would be just lethal. vitamin C. Yeah, yes. it would be lethal. Um, Leyland was a dumpster fire in the automotive industry that is fascinating. Um, we will discuss the decline of the British motor industry. Yes, and we will also discuss one of the coolest cars to come out of the British Leyland uh Gloop of conglomerate of, of of bad car companies called the Rover SD1, of which I've hopefully just published a revelations video. Um, don't forget if you like this content, you can consider uh, subscribing to the Haggerty Podcast Drivers Network. Club. <laughs> Haggerty I, Drivers Club. I did Club. much better when I had this in front of me. If you like this this content, you can consider joining the Haggerty Drivers Club, which includes unlimited flatbed tows for all of your classic cars, a subscription to our award winning magazine. Uh, VIP discounts and events on cool stuff and access unlimited to our access valuation to our valuation tool. tool. We are done. Let's go to the movie. The boop, 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 boop. Yes, and then discuss poor British motoring. Fantastic. I'm leaking oil and anticipation. You should get that checked. Okay, Rover Notes. All right, so we're apparently doing a video a podcast, an episode. Hi, how are you? <laughs> I'm well, thanks. How are you? Do you know who I am? Where I am? Who is the president of the United States? Let not me, JFK. <laughs> no, not after that day. That uh, was a bad day. Uh, I, let me guess. Some old fuck. Hmm. I think that I'm trying to find an answer that's not going to piss everyone off because it seems like in this, in this political well, let's change climate. topics. We're talking about um, rovers. We're trying to coordinate the release of an episode approximately, somewhat approximately, with the release of your episode on uh, the Rover SD1. Yes, that was the intention. I hope it works. Um, Revelations episode. Revelations that episode. Say. That was a really fun one to do. And, you know, I think for we've... you, the viewers are all going to be like, Ugh. no, no, actually not. Because so I thought, so <clears throat> the way this typically works is I have my list of it's a very high tech handwritten scribbled list of all the cars that I want to cover for revelations. And then everyone's while Anthony will throw in a suggestion and like, I just keep yelling at him. Like you write the fucking script. Like he really wants me to do F40 and he's like F40, F40. I'm like, I know why you want me to do F40 because you want to see an F40 in the studio and you want to play with it and lick it and touch it. And I do too. The problem is I don't know the story behind it. So it doesn't really matter how cool the car is. Revelations is about the story behind the car, um, which is nice because if I borrow a car from somebody that's a pile of shit, I don't have to, I don't have to say this car sucked. I just talk about its gestation. In this case, I was able to say it's a pile of shit because I own it, but I have to also be careful. Like I don't want to insult Haggerty's client base what about all the other sd1 owners on haggerty i would love to know the metrics of how many sd1s oh, are insured by haggerty the only other one i know of is jamie kitman who i used to work with mm-hmm. an automobile he's got a yellow one he had a yellow automatic and now has a 2600 which by all accounts were even worse um, so the 2600 shall we jump right in well okay to rover sd1 he, variants here's why i think this is important for us to talk about british leyland and rover in in British Land in general and Rover in, in, in specific, we're seeing the same uh, God, seriously thing. COVID brain is a fucking actual thing. Like I need to go to the doctor. It's been a month. I can't think. I can't remember anything. I just fall asleep at rent. Sometimes <clears throat> it's very anyway. Like annoying. I'm so fucking over this shit. Anyway, I genuinely thought COVID was over and um it's now kicking the shit in me. Um we're seeing the same consolidation in the in the car industry that mm-hmm. we saw in the 1960s and 70s in the British car industry. But not state mandated. Okay, I think that was a result of and I again not only did I not take American history, I didn't take any history cuz fuck that shit. But um the I think that was the reason there was state state mandated consolidation was because the government was trying to sort of slow down the plane that was about to crash on the ground, right? It was a governmental policy that was mm-hmm. saying, let's bolster this. We had that, right? I mean, we had the bailouts yes. many years ago. Um, 15. But if I look up Stellantis, 
please ask your doctor if Stellantis is right for you. Um, yeah, when they came out with that name, I think was just about like, Accept All Cookies, our brands. Think about this way Stellantis now includes Abart, Alfa Romeo, Chrysler, Citroën, Dodge, Deus, Fiat, Jeep, Lancia, Maserati, Opel, Peugeot, Ram, Vauxhall, Free to Move, and Liasis. The last two of which I've never heard of. Gesundheit. Danke. But if you think about this, like Fiat, Lancia, those are deeply Italian brands interwoven into the Italian identity. Citroën, 100% French. Jeep, literally couldn't be more American if it had a fucking American flag on everything. Uh, Don't they? Isn't that their thing? Easter eggs? I don't know. Easter eggs, but yeah. But Abarth, Alfa Romeo. I mean, these Chrysler, these are genuinely nationalistic brands that are all put together in one huge conglomerate of goop. Mm-hmm. That's horrifying to me. That Opel, which was General Motors, is now Peugeot, which is also now Chrysler, which is Jeep, which is Ram. It's, it's, this is insane. And we've seen this once before, and I think there are probably a lot of lessons to be learned from the Leyland f- disaster. So yes, um, so I think it is relevant for us to understand. This is ironic that I'm going to say this. If you don't understand history, you're bound to repeat it. Somebody said that once. Probably somebody stupid. Um, but <laughs> as someone who's never taken a history class about politics, I think it's really important for us to look back at Leyland because it really is a, uh, a warning sign that shit's going down. Mm-hmm. So, um, given that you were there running the company at the time, would you like to explain who Leyland is, first of all? So, Leyland was formed in 1968. How do you... Hold on, wait a second. No, it wasn't. British Leyland. British Leyland okay. was formed in 1968 by, through the merger of Leyland, tr- the Leyland Group, Leyland Trucks, which also included Alvis and... Um, what else was in there? Stand by one. <laughs> but hold on. Consult. Did you just know the 1968 number? Or did you just pull it out of your yes, ass? Yes, that one I did. But I wanted to con- confirm the, the the flow of this because it's so complex. Okay, so it included Rover, Al- Alvis, and Triumph. And Rover includes Land Rover, of course, because those were the same yes. company. Uh, so that was formed through the merger of, let's see, initially there was BMC. Let's start at the beginning. You know, the beginning is the beginning earlier is than that. 1985. Yes, for Rover, for Rover. itself. See, but let's year. start through the conglomeration. So there was BMC initially, which was formed in the early post-war years, 1952, uh, through British the merger Motor Car Company. Or yes, something. that's yeah. right. Through the merger of Austin and Morris, who were previously mortal enemies, and they merged in 1952. Things were reasonably harmonious. So BMC included, you know, the Mini is probably one of their most famous products. Uh, also, part of that is MG Morris Garage. So that's the sports car brand of Morris. Uh, Austin Healey, which is the sports car brand of Austin. So Austin and Morris each bring their own sports car brands together. Uh, And then there was like Riley and Woolsey and some other very British sounding things. Uh, (laughs) And so that's 1952. (laughs) Things are reasonably harmonious. You know, the British motor industry was very strong in the 1950s. uh, And there were... I think it's a bit of an understatement. They were Yes, it was. I think it was the third largest car maker in the world Mm -hmm. or something like that. Uh, and so things were reasonably harmonious, despite the fact that Morris and uh, Austin had been rivals with each other up until that point. Uh, and then they added in Jaguar and Pressed Steel, which is the company that made the bodies for Jaguar in 1966. Uh, and so that becomes BMH, British Motor Holdings. Uh, and that only lasted for two years before they added in uh, Leyland, which was Alvis rover and triumph Mm -hmm. together and that's what starts british leyland Uh, leyland also includes a truck manufacturer they make buses that was where they their start was trucks and buses right yes for for leyland itself but the leyland group during just prior to the formation of british leyland also included other car makers so then you have basically every british car maker except for the the roots group is not part of this at this time which is what was talbot and chrysler uh oh that came later that it got folded into to British Leyland? Maybe. I don't know. But it was a wow. separate... Was that your phone or mine? I think it's yours. Sorry. Oh, ding, ding, ding. I, oh, Sorry. But, okay. But while you're muting your phone, let's think oh, about this for a second. The Oh, that might be my laptop. Who knows? 
uh, so what we just talked about Solantis and all of those disparate brands, you mm-hmm. know, the French brands or whatever, think about Stellantis when I'm giving you the list of all of the brands that were under British Leyland, Austin, Land Rover, Leyland, MG, Riley, Wolseley, Vondenpla, Princess, Jaguar, Mini, Innocenti, Morris, Rover, Triumph, Albion, AEC, Guy, and Scamel. And also, why did they not list Daimler? But the, it was, I guess, a division of Jaguar at that point. I mean, think about the amount of different brands all under one out of nowhere under one. Well, it progressively happened over the course of three mergers and 20 years. And the same thing I would say about Stellantis. Yes. 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 Uh, And the reason they kept a lot of these brands around because they were sort of, you imagine old timey British people who have strong allegiances to, you know, I'm a Rover person or I'm a, actually more likely it was, I'm a Morris person or I'm an Austin person. Mm -hmm. And so when those two merged together, they felt it was in their best interest to keep both of those brands separate. I guess it's the same thing that underpinned GM doing what GM did. I mean, GM honestly formed through a similar mechanism you have Oldsmobile and Pontiac and you know those are the ones that don't exist anymore plus obviously Chevrolet and Cadillac and all of the various components of GM yeah Yeah, so they kept all of those brands until eventually the people who cared died (laughs) uh, I think as near as I can tell is what happened with with uh, the American brands and I think that happened to some extent with the the British brands during the Leyland period uh, as well, and the the time leading up to it. So, uh, is that a sufficient? We I guess we should go back and talk about Rover before all this as well. And do you want to do that now, or do sure? You wanna... I mean, Rover was Rover started out as a bicycle company. Eighteen eighty five, yes. they invented the Rover Safety Bicycle, mm-hmm. which set the footprint for every bicycle we ride today. Um, prior to that, those penny bike- farthing. Bless you. Thank you. Um, Penny Farthing was a, I, it's a that's a word I Those are know. the gigantic front wheel bicycle. And so the idea was that you eat shit on one of those and it's bad. And so the safety bicycle, which was invented by Rover, same Rover company as you learned in your yeah. research. I remember it was you, called It was called the Rover Safety Bicycle. The, the company itself was called something else, but the, the bicycle was called Rover, which became mm-hmm. the whole company. Mm-hmm. And then it was, it was actually interesting to learn that in many languages, uh, the term Rover is so synonymous with bicycle that the word for bicycle is Rover. So uh, Ukraine, half of the Ukraine uh, uses the word Rover as a bicycle. And there are some spots sort of all over the world um, that use that. So that was 1885. And then in 1904, I believe it was, they started making cars and then, and motorcycles. And I think it was motorcycles in 18 something and like 1895 or 98 or something and cars in 1904. You know, I don't actually care about motorcycles. Sorry. <clears throat> um, but I know, I know you do, but, uh, yeah. So the, the Rover company has been, has been around for quite, quite some time. Mm-hmm. Um, and the sort of general feeling from, of course, I don't have any experience with very early Rovers, but they were somewhere between Jaguar and, and, um, Rolls Royce in terms of prestige and build quality, right? They were yeah. in the in that general league. They were they were high end cars, yeah. and so I would say if you were to try and characterize, you know, all these British names sound like word soup to most people nowadays. Uh, but each of those brands occupied a different role. You know, I, I don't know what the difference between an Austin and a Morris was, honestly, because they were always brand they were always badged engineered copies of each other for the period that I was always paying attention to cars. But in, during this period, Rover and Jaguar were maybe like, who was the kind of type of person who would buy a Rover? Very, very British. Very British. You know, Jaguars had a sort of rakish, uh, international sort of appeal to them, quite sporting. Uh, Funny, we never think of that. In the, I, I don't think our generations think of that in the U.S., but yeah, Jaguars so were I just, sporty cars. Yeah, I just wrote an article for Haggerty Insider about Jaguar and the image that they had. And we've mm. done an episode about Jaguar. Mm. We said about dead, dead brand walking. Right, right. But if you're going to talk about this period of, call it, you know, 1960, we'll just do a brief recap. What Jaguar meant was, you know, 1948, they come out with a... a all new aluminum because for the same reason Land Rover used aluminum, nobody could get steel, a sports car to show off their new sophisticated twin cam engine. And this was the XK120. It was the fastest car in the world. A very exciting, cutting edge, sexy, you know, innovative, not a neoclassical look at the past like we think of Jaguar as if you're thinking about cars from the 2000s or 90s. Uh, and then they won Le Mans five times in the 1950s. Uh, and they had semi-monocoque construction and introduced independent rear suspension and, disc, and brakes. disc brakes all around and a twin cam engine. There was no other sports car that offered all those features at any price point, including Ferrari or Maserati or Porsche or Mercedes or anyone else. 
1961 when the E-Type came out. It was truly cutting edge, you know, totally futuristic stuff. Rover was much more traditional. They didn't really make sports cars, uh, although they did go to Le Mans with a turbine-powered car. <laughs> Well, that's the, yeah, that's where shit gets really crazy. So Rover was also making gas turbine engines and actually they were, uh, they were concentrated. So there was a lot of turbines of late fifties, early sixties. Everyone was making, everyone was making, playing around with right. turbine cars, Chrysler um, turbine, of course. There's actually a great uh, documentary that Haggerty Drivers Foundation, which has nothing to do with what we do and, and uh, regular Haggerty video stuff, did a great documentary on the Chrysler turbine car. Um, and so there was just a big push where sort of everyone kind of thought turbines were the, were the near future. And the, the turbine thing is kind of important for what happens later with the SD one, but yes. rovers were, um, yeah. So we were trying to, def mm -hmm. so I, I went off on this parallel yeah, about Jaguar, right. but the definition of Rover at that time, if Jaguar is all sex and sort of modernity and cutting edge, Rover is a respectable sort of upper middle class car. You can't quite afford, you're not aristocratic enough to buy a Rolls Royce or a mm -hmm. Bentley. Uh, but you are, um, your computer's talking. I don't think that, I mean, the, the mics won't. Very it. weird. The yeah. Wi-Fi is off on the computer, and yet it's getting sorry notifications. Anyway, sorry if you're here, you ding in the background. Uh, uh, yeah, so, so you're not so sufficiently the, aristocratic to buy Rolls. Yeah, Royce. and they don't make sports cars, so it's a very sort of like exactly what you think of if you're imagining a caricature of an early post-war British person mm -hmm. with a bowler hat and be spectacled and always wearing a tie and all of that stuff. That's you're going. Why don't you look at the camera because Jake's going to have to put a hat and a tie and spectacles. Oh yes, on perfect. Your, oh, there we there go. There we are. There we go. There's the rover driver. <laughs> um, and, and so you know they're they're high quality, well engineered, luxurious cars that uh, just you know it's like the Mercedes Benz of of Britain yeah. effectively yeah. conservative, of wood, very but, very conservative style. Like, yes. But a lot of engineering. Yes. Well-engineered, right. thoughtfully designed, mm -hmm. high-quality cars. Expensive uh, engineering stuff, yeah, including you were, suspension designs that yes. they were pioneering. Yes. This is what defines Rover, I would say, especially, I mean, during the 1930s and the early post-war years. And I think we talked about how they considered themselves primarily a car maker. And then early post-war, they, in order to get steel, we've talked about this, export or die. In order to get steel to build things, you needed to have a proven export record. And so they invented this new product that could be made out of aluminum that they could export, could be made and designed relatively cheaply. And that was the Land Rover. That came out in 1948. And by 1951, they were outselling Rover cars three to one. Yep. And so, muddled on the Jeep, the U.S. Jeep. Yes, right? that's right. It was inspired by a Jeep that uh, Spencer Wilkes had on his farm in Anglesey. In the British Isles and other agricultural countries, there are still many farmers who rely on the horse as a means of pulling machinery and heavy loads. What I want, says many a farmer, is something that can do everything the horse can do, plus a lot more, and at three times the speed. And here it is, the Land Rover. A tough, chunky, cheeky, versatile vehicle with an unlimited capacity for hard work. You can almost see it cock a snook at the old horse in the next field and hear it say, Anything you can do, I can do better. Uh, so that was what Rover was. And they made cars like that all the way through the end of the 60s, mm -hmm. really until they were uh, joined British Leyland. Yeah, so they had two cars, they had two series of cars. Um, and the, the hard part t for me to keep track of was, unlike modern cars where you have a three series and a five series, you know, sort mm -hmm. of sort of cars that have a family, They the cars had project names basically and mm -hmm. uh so they had p5 and p6 at the same time and they, uh, before p4, that was p4 p4 and so p4 was the, first, was the luxury car it was the first clean sheet post-war right. car design so p4 was the a full-size car p6 replaced it so four and six were the full-size car and five, p5 no, is the big one god damn it five is a big one p5 is four the big and one. six are the middle size ones mm -hmm. yes <laughs> that's this is why it's impossible to keep track of mm -hmm. um uh, but it's important to look at that lineage, and they were both very, very expensive cars to produce. They were they were high tech in kind of every way, mm -hmm. um, and it came time for Rover to replace the P five, no, P six, which is the little one. Mm -hmm. P five is the big one, right? Yes. They were in the process of making the P five, and they created. The, I think it was the P eight. There was a it was a yes. big car, and it was done. Yes. Um, right time where, period here, by the way, is approximately it's the late sixties. Late sixties, right? That car was done, engineered, and they were putting the tooling together to start making the factory when Rover was uh, combined with Triumph into the Leyland Group. So it became part of yes, Leyland. joining Jaguar, who was already part of the the affair since nineteen sixty six. So this happens in nineteen sixty eight. Jaguar had been part of 
BMH, British Motor Holdings, since 1966. Mm -hmm. When they add Rover and Triumph to it in 1968, then it becomes British Leyland. So Jaguar's already there. Jaguar had really been just knocking it out of the park. Let's talk for a moment, because we talked about Jaguar sports cars for a moment earlier. Uh, So 1961, the E-Type comes out. It has all this crazy technology in it. This is in March of 61. In October of 61, the Mark 10 came out, which was this gigantic car. It was the widest British car ever until the XJ220. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that car had basically all the same technical underpinnings as the E-Type. So it has independent rear suspension in a sedan, disc brakes all around, the twin cam engine. Like, it was really sexy. Uh, But it was huge. Uh, And then they had a smaller line of sedans that were less sophisticated. They had live rear ends and eventually... Jaguar's like, we should sort of combine all of these sedan products into a right-sized car that's not as small as a Mark II and not as big as a Mark X. And that was, it came out in 1968. That was the XJ6, mm-hmm. which existed, persisted for, for 20 years. years. Right. <laughs> and then another, you know, couple decades after they redesigned it for the first time mm-hmm. in 1986. Right. Uh, and so Jaguar is riding high. That that was, I think, still probably ca- counts as one of the most beautiful sedans ever made and the fact that you could get technology that was winning Le Mans years a few years before in a family car Mm -hmm. that could actually handle and had some performance was just like all the people who were like man I need a family car but I want it to be as sexy as possible that was the car to buy which is so funny because we think of it as such an outdated design because they left it alone for so long right right. but when it came out in 1968 just bleeding edge stuff and Much the, more sexy than what Rover was doing in terms right, of energy. Right, exactly. Rover stuff, if you look at it, it's all chrome and it's just all yeah, It's very, very upright. upright. It's, yeah. like a, it's like a poor person's Rolls Royce right. or less yeah, and aristocratic even, And if you Rolls look at Royce. some of the, even the ads from the time, I mean, you know, these were chauffeur driven cars. It's all about decorum. And, yeah. Yes. Sort um, of upper management instead of head of state type yep. of car. And so you can imagine the first thing that Jaguar did when Rover comes in with this P8 is say, kill it. Right, because yes. right off the bat, it was going to compete with the XJ6. Mm-hmm. Um, and William Lyons, who has really lit the darling of the British motor industry because he had delivered such successful cars. I mean, the image of Jaguar, grace, space, and pace was their tagline, but William Lyons was famous for bringing just like, you know, innovation and sex appeal at really reasonable prices. I mean, when the E-Type came out, it was 2,000 pounds sterling, and a Porsche 356 with its pushrod four-cylinder engine of 90 horsepower was 2,800 pounds. So 2,000 pounds versus 2,800 pounds, you know, an Aston Martin was 4,000 pounds, mm-hmm. and a Ferrari was 6,000 pounds. Right. So, I mean, it was it cost much less than a Porsche, half as much as an Aston, a third as much as a Ferrari. And, and outperformed them all. Yes, and then you put the same stuff into a sedan that regular mm-hmm. old people can buy, you know, mm-hmm. and you sell your wife, of course, because that's the patriarchal society that existed at the time on look honey we're getting a practical car and you're like meanwhile it has twin cams and irs and disc brakes and overdrive and all that stuff uh so so jaguar Jaguar was very much william lyons had a lot of uh, gravitas yep at at uh in leyland so they literally killed the car after it was already completed and about i think it was two weeks away from entering pre-production some like unbelievable last second thing Mm -hmm. of course you can imagine all the the rover engineers were furious Mm -hmm. um and uh so instead they were all turned all the effort turned on to replacing the mid-size car um next which was the p6 p6 and also the triumph 2000 so what the the group once triumph and rover were put together they were put together together in a group put together in a group called the RT, Rover Triumph Group. This is after, um, this is within British Leyland. Within British Leyland. Yes. Um, and they were, they're, prior to joining, the P6 competed directly with the Triumph 2000. Mm-hmm. So these were both sedans, mid-sized sedans, competing directly against one another that were now 10 year, eight or 10 years old. And so the teams were put together and told both of these cars would be replaced with one. And at the time, it was not clear whether that was going to be, it was going to be badged or sold as a Rover or Triumph or even just as a Leyland. (laughs) Or yeah, or just uh, this is the new Leyland sort of midsize saloon. Um, Which sort of did happen as a sidebar in Australia. There was a car sold with a a sedan sold with a Leyland badge badge on on it, it, the P76. Right. Mm. Which was apparently an unmitigated disaster. Well, all of, everything that came out of Leyland was an unmitigated yes. disaster. We haven't quite gotten we there yet. Gotten there Should we yet. talk about powertrains? If you in the vintage Rover, the, the pre Leyland Rover era, yeah, uh, sure. So the initial uh, the the P six initially came out with a two liter inline four. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, and then the, which is this is the midsize car. This is the smaller right. of the two mm-hmm. sedans that they were making. And then there was the P5, right. uh, and the P5 had a three liter inline six, which was sort of a big, long stroke in the mm-hmm. typical British fashion for the taxation scheme reasons, which we have discussed before. Um, so there was a six cylinder and a four cylinder car, uh, and Rover was not selling super well in the United States. And so there's this whole backstory about the creation of the Buick V8, uh, the, the Buick Rover V8. Uh, and so that V8 was. The rights were acquired in January of 65 by the Rover Group from GM, who had discontinued it because they were having troubles with working with aluminum because it was an aluminum engine. First American. We have talked about the Rover V8 at length in a previous episode. Go watch that one. Uh, But anyway, so 1965, Rover gets the rights to it. They do a bunch of re-engineering. They put one into, you know, a a P6, I think, and gave it to the board of some member of the board of directors to drive. And he was like, oh, this is quite good. Actually said it was the first Rover he'd ever driven that wasn't underpowered. Yeah. Quote. Yeah, so that we so now they have a great V8 that mm-hmm. they have inherited, roverized, quite significantly re-engineered. Don't let anyone tell you that that engine is just a GM engine. It's substantially re-engineered. In a bunch it was of, re-engineered in the in the in the methods of construction rather than the engi- the fundamental engineering. The engineering itself was sound, but the way it was produced was. Not yes. Ready. So, like improved bearings and carburetors that didn't stall when having lateral acceleration, well, but also and, porosity of the the block. So, one of the biggest problems yes. with GM, the reason it was so expensive for GM to produce it was that the throwaway rate was so high um, because there they was, didn't know how to make aluminum stuff. Exactly. So, Rover went to, or I guess it, yeah, it would be Rover at the time went to. Um, uh, to a bunch of aluminum companies and worked with them to figure out how to actually pour the blocks so mm-hmm. that they weren't porous. Uh, and so it wasn't actually that much more expensive to produce it. It was just that they were throwing out. So yes, they weren't throwing out a third of the motors produced. And Americans tended not to really pay attention to coolant levels that closely because iron motors are pretty forgiving in that respect and aluminum are very sensitive to getting too hot and then right. they warp and then they leak and then you just get You're more done. problems. You get leaks from that and the porosity. Mm-hmm. It's... Yep. Uh, and I think they're having some chemical reactions that led to sludging inside of those engines but in the, the American installations. Yes, because well. people weren't putting coolant in it. And so, yes, they were just putting water right. instead of distilled water. Um, but the, going back to the... Uh, so the Rover was making a turbine engine that competed in 64 and 65 Le in Le Mans. I think it finished. It either. finished. Eighth yeah. um, at Le Mans, which is pretty amazing. Um, and actually the, the V8 happened because um, the Rover managing director... In the UK, it said, look, uh, they, they hired a, a U.S. guy who said, listen. Bruce McWilliams. Need, yes. You need a V8 for the U.S. market. Uh, he was trying to talk Chrysler into selling them a V8, which is interesting. But instead. But Chrysler's like, hey, we're using this. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you instead, can't have it. The Brit, the, the actual chairman, wound up in the U.S. in Wisconsin. Um, Fond du Lac. At, yeah, Fond Fond du Lac, I think it was a beautiful Fond du Lac. Is that That's how they say it in Wisconsin. Oh, God. Um, he went up at Mercury Marine, initially trying to sell them a gas turbine engine for fishing trawlers. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then they started talking about the diesel that was in the Land Rovers, and they were going to try to buy that. And while he was there, he literally saw an aluminum V8 uh, sitting on the ground. Yes. And the quote was, what, uh, what on earth is that? And what on earth was that? That was the the, the Buick 215. So that, um, it's a really cool story on how that happened, that he was trying to sell a turbine engine mm-hmm. to a fishing boat engine company, uh, yes. one of finding an engine, talking GM. GM didn't take him seriously because they didn't think anyone would actually be interested in that. Well, engine. yeah, because they had only had it in production, I think, from summer of 60 to summer of 63. Three years. Uh, and so the, they had had so many issues with them that they were just like, ah, fuck it. What they did was they cut two cylinders off and turned it into a cast iron block and then made a V6. Which was America's first production V6 ever. 90 yeah. degrees, of 47 course. 47 year production yeah, run. until 2000, whatever. Yeah, that's the Buick 3800 that we all know that mm-hmm. was supercharged, it was turbocharged, it was naturally aspirated. There were so many different series of that engine. Um, yeah, no, I mean, one of the one of the longest lasting production engines of, uh, of all time came out of that V8. Yes, and then uh, they also figured out how to do sort of smaller V8 castings out of iron in a way they were like, okay, and all the benefits of aluminum, there's no point. This was too much right. trouble, it wasn't worth it, so they should can it after three years. Right. So in any case, they are now moving on to a point where the engine is useless to them, and they're like, yeah, sure, you want to give us money in exchange for this? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, you can have it. Have it. And then Rover fixed it mm-hmm. and uh, used it for, a, let's see, 78, 88, 98, another 35 years. 37. 30, yeah, until, until 2004 in yeah. the uh, Series 2 4.6 liter Discovery. Yes. 
long lasting engine. Yes. Both of them, both the V6 and V8. But okay. So Rover winds up putting the V8 into its big car. Mm-hmm. Um, and the small car. And the small car and selling them both in the US. Yeah, the P5B, B yes. for Buick. For Buick, yeah. yeah. Uh, so there's P5B and the P6, both have the Rover V8 in it, but the uh, the five dies off because of Jaguar. The six winds up getting replaced uh, with this new car together with, uh, with Triumph to replace Triumphs, which was a four-cylinder only car, right? 2000. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, interesting. Uh, that the, the two cars are combined. Um, the interesting thing to me, the car was originally called the RT1, Rover Triumph 1, which was then renamed the SD1 for Specialist Division. Rover Triumph Division was renamed Specialist Division. Yeah, because those are sort of like prestigious performance-oriented cars as opposed to the rest of British Leyland, which is making sort of uh, Austin Morris sort of Right, and those were, sort of there was a name for that division. Cars. I don't remember. It was like the Generalist Division and the Specialist Division. Don't mm-hmm. quote me on the Generalist. But um, So I didn't realize the car was originally called an RT1, and what happened was both companies submitted a de- design proposal so there are actually photos that exist of uh, of clay models mm. of the submissions, um, and it was Rover's submission that worked, and Rover's submission was that of a hatchback, mm-hmm. uh, which was highly unusual at this point in the 1960s, um, and uh, and so that design goes through, it, and the car was terrible looking. Like it's really interesting to see the car was actually not pretty at all, but it win- wins the design contest, um, and they start to put to get the car closer to production um and you sort of see what was happening here was that rover sort of got like haha we just won like you know we won the design contest we're going to trounce triumph on here and while we're at it let's make a jaguar version of this car and let's make a daimler version of the car (laughs) so they also made scale model or scale i think they were clay models or full-size uh models of of these cars mock-ups of these cars to show that like this new SD1 platform that they were coming up with could be used by Jaguar. Jaguar, by the way, and it specifically engineered the Series 3 to never, ever be able to fit a, a Rover V8. No, oh, this what. was the XJ40 they did that with. Which was the XJ40 or the 3? When did the 3 come out? 1981. Yeah, I thought that was... But that was just a, the, the XJ6 came out in 1968 and they were just keeping the architecture right, keeping... intact. It was actually the XJ40 40 40 that was that designed was, okay. never to have a V8. And the reason for that was because Ford owned them and they didn't want Ford to put a V8 in that oh, car. Oh, no, no, no. I believe that what I saw in the research was far earlier that they got wind of this Rover V8 and they really? did not... Yeah, they specifically engineered the XJ6 to never be able to fit the, the Rover V8 in it. The XJ6 had already existed at this point. Okay, well, then we have a tri- impasse. How, hold on. How is this possible? Because the XJ6 came out in 1968, and they didn't really change the architecture of the engine compartment. And, of course, it had a Jaguar V12 in it also. Right, but the V12 is a 60, not a 90. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, this was earlier on. So they must have had some idea that they were going to wind up in, in Leyland together. Maybe in 1968 68. or earlier than that. Yeah. Okay. I mean, if you th- what year did they, they got wrapped in in 68? They must. Mm-hmm. I bet they made changes to it. But they, that was in the book, in a book that was written in the eighties that I that I read. So the the XJ forty didn't even exist yet. So they must have done it twice, two times. Made sure that that XJ six yes. wouldn't have some fucking American V eight in it. Well, the problem um, was then that they it wasn't big enough to fit the V twelve either in the XJ forty's case, whoops. and then they had to re-engineer, re-engineer it. The whole car again, that's yeah. why the the XJ forty version of the XJ twelve came out five so years, later, yeah. six years after. The yeah. six-cylinder version, because they were like, "Whoops, we uh, we did too much yeah. to prevent the V8, and now the V12 doesn't, doesn't fit. fit." Yeah, yes. um, interesting though, but that they were they sort of all looked down on this uh, V8 as well, an American. Well, this is also representative. Generally, this type of dynamic is representative of the thing that caused British Leyland to fail, which was that all of the individual components were sort of still acting like individual components instead of collaborating. And right. so they you, were they were they were competitors in the marketplace that were suddenly shoved in the same prison cell. Yes. They're going to kick the shit out of each other. Yeah. And so um, it was deeply problematic. And there was also a lot of stuff that they were saddled with for government reasons. So, for example, in order to try and develop less developed, economically developed portions of England, a lot of these manufacturers, and this happened to the Hillman Group and Roots and all that, is in addition to ha- happening within British Leyland, was in order to promote employment, they forced them to build factories in weird places where there mm-hmm. were, wasn't talented workforce as, as a way to prop up 
you know, employment. And then, of course, wonder why the stuff coming out of there is kind of junk. Well, yeah, it was uh, fully untrained workers with no experience and no one to train Yeah, them. and at some point they had, you know, I think 40-something different factories strewn across Great Britain. In the, in, and, you know, they're, they're all making different products and right. some of them have to get pushed together and work together. And mm-hmm. a lot of this is also... Um, this is typical of what happened with the British rail system also. What happened was that none of it got bombed during the war, and so they had all this pre-existing infrastructure, mm-hmm. basically, that was ancient, because they had, it dates back to the start of the Industrial Revolution in some mm-hmm. cases. And so they have all these sort of hodgepodge of ancient systems that haven't really been comprehensively modernized, uh, that are all trying to produce modern equipment or, mm-hmm. or cars, uh, or, the, you know, same thing with trains. And so it's just all sort of pieced together in a, a very uh, slipshod or hodgepodge kind of way that... Yep made things difficult. You know, they're having to truck body shells from one side of the street to the other, literally exposed in the weather. After they designed the Austin 1800, they found out that it was too wide to fit in the tunnel that links the two halves of Longbridge together over this road here. So what they had to do was load them all onto trucks on this side of the road. Bear in mind, they were unpainted at this stage, take them across two lanes of traffic, and then a quarter of a mile up there in all weathers with salt on the roads, and then through a gate just beyond the brow of the hill. That's fantastic! Of course, the cars start rusting before they even get painted for the first time, and people are like, why is this happening? Who can well, say? Yeah, who can say? <laughs> so a lot of infighting yeah. within, within, you know, oh, so, tons. so the organization can't even compete with outside organizations because they're too busy sort of stepping on each other's toes inside, right. and then you have all of this labor unrest, which is representative, I think globally, this happened in Italy at the same time. The mm-hmm. 1970s were a time of a lot of industrial unrest. I mean, riots in the United States mm-hmm. during the same time. It was a, that's why it's called the Malaise era. Right. Uh, so yes, what happened next with the SD-1? So SD-1, interestingly, is developing, so it, all of the mechanicals are Triumph, and I don't think I realized that the SD-1 is actually more Triumph than it is Rover. Hmm. So the, the 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 only thing, they couldn't decide on a whole bunch of different things on the car, but what had been decided initially right off the bat was it would use two different straight sixes that were to be a brand new Triumph design, or the Rover V8, which was the Buick V8, um, but it would use the TR7's front strut suspension and rear solid axle. Mm-hmm. Everything I've read... TR7 was, is a wedge-shaped sports, sports car, car that is existing at the same time. Which also had the V8 in it. Um, then it was the on. TR8. TR8, yeah. Um, but the the everything I've read back in the day on the SD1 was like, well, Rover was trying to save costs, and that's why Rover went went from their their very expensive, complicated De Dion rear suspension system to this very simple um, uh, solid rear. axle. That's not actually fully the story. The story was basically Triumph was put in charge of the chassis. Like, hey, Triumph. This, you use struts, you use a rack and pinion, and you use a solid rear axle. Just, just fucking copy that shit from the TR7 and throw it into this new car because it's cheap and done. But I don't think I'd ever really heard that it was done because it was existent already and it was already in Triumph. What mm. Rover did was say that rear end is not good enough for us. Um, and so they put in a torque tube and a, an, another linkage and all this other stuff to to fix locate some the of the axle. locate right fix some of the axle location issues from the TR7. So they actually expanded on it. But mm. if you wonder why the SD1 has steering that was 2.7 turns lock to lock at a time where sports cars were four and four and a half, well, it's because it was all stuff from a sports car. That also explained why it handled so well, right? It was mm-hmm. all sports car derived shit. So it's effectively a, a Triumph. It's very Jaguar like. Yeah, right. Triumph in suspension and chassis design. Rover used this crazy um, monocoque design that was also really expensive with body panels that were hung on top of it, of, of a monocoque, where, where Triumph used traditional unibody. And so they went with a traditional Triumph unibody, Triumph suspension, Rover engine, um, except for the two straight sixes that, that Triumph was developing. Um, so they were really at each other's throats for this whole thing. Mm-hmm. And the design looked terrible. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll put some inserts in it. The car was just not pretty, um, which is amazing. Right, and you think I'm, I might be a little bit biased, but I think the SD1 was stunningly beautiful. Is today and must have been absolutely insane to look at in 1976 when it went into production. What I don't think I realized was the car was progressing and it just wasn't doing well to the point where Leyland was so dissatisfied with the progress that they hired Michelotti. 
uh, to go design a car with that that those hard points, and it's terrible. <laughs> it's like, the Michelotti one. The Michelotti is terrible. It sort of almost looks Mira esque with this strange horn of a door and this weird triangle. It was bizarre looking, um, but that lit such a fire under Rover's design team, which was done by David Bache, who is the guy who did the Range Rover also. Um, that he that he, this is nuts. He borrows a Maserati Indy from a friend of his, who was working on some other company, and they had a they had a Maserati temporarily as a as like a test mule. Borrowed the car and had the entire design staff locked in the design studio for a weekend with him. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they just said, "Well, what if we just make this SK one look like?" a Maserati Indy. So they took, they took sections of the bodywork and made molds of them and actually transferred the, the curves uh, and the swoopiness from the Maserati <laughs> onto these hard points. And the, the clay model that they were done. And then by the way, took, he was in love with Ferrari's David Beige. So it took the Daytona headlight shape and the scallop, the side scallop that went mm-hmm. all the way around the car and just grafted it on. And if you see what came out of that design studio after just one weekend, they had been working on this car for two years, I think at this point, fucked futz in with the design and futz in with it and fight and just, it was, it was getting worse and worse and worse. And all of a sudden, boom, takes one Maserati in the design studio a weekend and hopefully a lot of drugs, but then, and made this car that looked like genuinely looked like an exotic. Yeah. Um, and I, genuinely contemporary and it's also not fussy nope. you know it's not overly adorned it, I think it's aged very well it's, I look again I can't be objective about it but the shape to me it screams sports car I mean just the idea that you'd have a five seater hatchback um, is so nuts to begin with but in its proportions are perfect and actually after they built that clay model the, when they first built the first prototypes they were bringing them out into sunshine. And there's one photo that I'm going to have to dig up uh, where they actually brought it outside with Ferraris, Maseratis, Alfa Romeos, and Mercedes Benzes Mm. and put it there and said, does this car look out of place? They wanted it to look just as good and just as exotic Mm -hmm. as the exotic cars of the day. Hard to imagine when you look at, you know, the car that we bought with the big bumpers and and whatever else. But if you look at 70s, and this was 1976 production, so this is early 70s when they're putting this together. If you look at Ferraris and Maseratis and supercars of the day, like the Indy was, Mm -hmm. um, they're no more aggressive and no more uh, sort of swoopy than this car was. Mm -hmm. And then they went back in and started the interior over, which is, that to me is the biggest mind fuck. Because... To me, the that that car when we got in it when we bought it in Canada last year, I got in it and I'm like, oh my god, this this interior brings back such memories to me. I didn't put two and two together. It's a hundred percent a ripoff of Ferrari's interiors. Like the, the you know the books and Beige himself talked about the the Berlinetta Boxer as um, as inspiration for the seats and the door panels and some of the surfaces on the inside. Um, when you look at the cages, the font, the green it's illumination, identical. the 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 strangely wide um, needles, and then the bl- the black bezels around all the individual yes, gauges, the black boxes, complete fucking Ferrari knockoff. Yes, total. Yes, like I didn't know that because it I looks ho- like a three sixty five GTC four yeah. cluster. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Yeah. And the coolest thing is that the U.S. car has got a three po- three spoke Momo steering wheel mm-hmm. that looks just like a Ferrari Momo steering yeah. wheel. Yeah. Um, the Euro car has got this terrible blocky single spoke thing. Oh, it was a squircle, but it, they had a name for it. Um, hmm. Oh fuck! What the? It was. It started on the Austin Allegro, and it was like the the worst part of that car. Everyone bitched about the steering wheel, but it was because Beige refused to allow any of the gauges to be blocked by the steering wheel. Um, oh. I'm going to have to put my phone it's up again. It's not a squircle. It's not a squircle. They had a name for it. Um, Austin, hold on. Um, steering wheel. It, I mean, it comes right up when you just start to say this. It was called the... Are you it's defeated? not coming up. It's not coming up. Quartic. Quartic. Yes, Q-U-A-R-T-I-C. yes, yes. T-I-C. Um, I mean, and it's, it was hideous. And so that was the first wheel that did this sort of squircle design um, that was universally panned. And they did the same thing again for the Rover SD1. And of course, you go through the, the reviews and everyone in the reviews of this car initially hated the steering wheel. And then you read the US reviews, which didn't get that steering wheel. And they're like, can't see the goddamn gauges. Yes. <laughs> so he was right. Yes. I mean, um, but that I just cannot believe the similarity between the gauges uh, 
to, to Ferrari stuff. And so you sit behind this, you know, in the, behind this wheel and you're like, I am in a Ferrari, but it's a manual. Okay. The gearbox is way too far over that way, but the shifter's great in it, whatever we're getting ahead of ourselves. So they put this car into production. Sorry. And how was it received? Embarrassing. It was embarrassing. Uh, the, the one quote that I read was, I think it was Autocar said um, uh, that the proverbial alien who would land on this country would, the, the hymn of praise was so uninterrupted or whatever that the, the proverbial alien would think this was indeed the only car in production on planet Earth. I mean, <laughs> the reviews were insane, insane. I mean, at 177 car, uh, of, the car year. of the year, which is amazing because it beat the fucking Mercedes 123. It beat the Porsche 924. It beat the Audi 100. I mean, it just beat some really big hitters. And the reviews, uh, there was a, there were wait lists on the car. They were selling over sticker. There were markups. Um, and it was basically the be all end all of sedans it looked like a ferrari it had genuinely it was zero to 60 in under nine seconds and we're talking in 1976 when everything was getting real slow mm-hmm. um so it was faster than a base corvette to 60 um uh, not in the u.s version that's a different story but i mean it was it was corvette fast it outhandled everything it had great steering because it was you know so quick not feelsome but so quick um and it was luxurious and it was a new shape that no one had ever seen and it was it had the longest fifth gear of any of the overall gearing of any other car in production in the world is that good after the facelift no it got better fuel economy than two liter audis so there was like uh, i've read one test they were doing all these two liter cars and the rover three and a half liter v8 beat them all fuel economy um because the engine was asleep on the highway yeah um so here, 130 mile an hour car that was just, it, would, it had more cargo room than today's Range Rover Sport. I mean, huge amount of space inside. Um, and then it all went to shit. Very quickly. Very quickly, people realized that there were some build quality issues. Mm-hmm. Um, and so in the in the revelations video I kind of go into some of the examples which are fucking hilarious um, you know like the, the, not one of the cars could ever contain a single drop of water without leaking um, all of them had trim falling off the initial bumpers in the in the Euro cars were so weak that like you could basically look at them and dent them so they were all dented um, they, they had some really wild like innovative things to for corrosion protection which there are two things that made me laugh. One of them was this flow through ventilation system. So cars got a hood scoop, which I don't think I was ever really conscious about, but it's right there in the middle of the hood, big hood scoop. You open the hood. That's not feeding the motor. That's feeding these two enormous vents that are right by the firewall that also don't feed <laughs> what you think they do. They, it's not the cabin. It's kind of the cabin. There's a fan in there, but the primary purpose is to use that ram air to to go down these channels that go down the A-pillar and into the side rockers because the thought was water is always going to somehow get into the rockers. Um, and so let's just keep them ventilated. So as you're driving, all of this ram air kind of goes through the rockers, keeps them dry, keeps you know fresh air in there and stops them from rusting. Fucking absolutely did not work. I mean, the cars <laughs> rusted immediately. Yes, they're known um, for rusting. Partially because the, <laughs> the HVAC blower unit was from a tr7 and wasn't flow through <laughs> so it stopped all the air that was supposed to be going down there so if the fan was on you had rust protection if the fan was off well your car fucking rotted to the ground yeah because it was open to the atmosphere yeah the other well it was open to the atmosphere but then no air that was in there to dry it which yes, is hilarious that's right so it would just become a water pond. in yeah <laughs> and then my other favorite feature which you talked about is an electro dip process um <sighs> Which was, uh, um, uh, which was electrolytic tr- paint deposition, yes. in which you're supposed to give the the corrosion resistance uh, chemicals uh, the opposite charge of the car, so that they adhere. Yes, and they get electrolytically yeah. deposited. Right. So the idea there is the, the electric attraction. charge attracts the rust protection and the primer to the, the metal, getting eliminating any chance of any air or anything else in between them, thus ensuring corrosion protection as they called it um it's a process that is widely used today still yes. not in the way they did it on the sd1 they made a slight error they had the wires hooked up backwards i don't think they actually had the wires hooked up but the the polarity was reversed and the way they did it i think the cathode was I, the positive charge was the car or whatever the way they did it it actually repelled they were both um, the same charge so yes well no they weren't the same charge but it, it created air bubbles 
on the surface of the, the fucking metal. So basically they're ensuring uh, <sighs> air bubbles in between the paint and the car. And so the paint all flaked off on these cars. And then immediately they were corroding before they even left the factory. Um, and it wasn't until 1982 and the facelift, which is six years into production of the car, that somebody was like, oh, <laughs> reverse the wires and actually create it. They also moved the whole production to a different plant at that point. Were they in Sully Hill? They were Sully Hill originally, which was a plant that was developed Land Rover. under that whole thing of under underutilized uh. employees. Uh, they built a new plant at Sully Hill specifically for the SD1, but they had no trained labor <laughs> and they were all they making know what Land the fuck they were doing. So um, yeah. Uh, in 82, the car got a big facelift, which with a different instrument cluster, which I hate, which from the Range it's Rover. It's less charming. It looks more like a Range Rover. Yeah, yeah. it looks like a Range Rover rather than a Ferrari, and I'll take a, a Ferrari one. Uh, I also didn't realize Series 2 cars had a completely different rear window. It was much lower to stop people from backing over children and making more dents in their weak little bumpers. Um, <laughs> they did a bunch of changes, including uh, making the Vitesse version of mm -hmm. it. Um, and I really want to drive a Vitesse. Um, so the Vitesse was basically a sport pack, but not really. It was actually a homologation race car. Um, it got... Uh, yes, it was the car that beat the 190E Cosworth in its maiden, in the Cosworth's maiden year of touring car racing. We don't need to talk about that. <laughs> um, yeah, the thing was a monster. 190 horsepower. Did 100... For the streetcars, yeah. For the streetcars. Um, they did 0 to 60 in the UK magazines in 7.1, which tells me the US were, with our rollout and weather adjustment, would have been in this easily in the six six eight six nine, which was fucking fast for 1982. Mm -hmm. um, genuine. Well, Vitesse does mean speed. speed in French, yeah. Yeah. Um, but the, interestingly, they kept the rear drums because they had no discs that would meet up to the meet up to the Triumph um, rear axle. But the front got four piston AP racing calipers <laughs> from who else was using AP Aston Martin? Well, uh, they were also badge Lucas and used in the Range Rover. Huh. So they got Range Rover brakes up front, which actually were AP Racing slash Lucas four piston calipers. <laughs> and those calipers also wound up on Badge Lucas, the LM02 Lamborghini, huh. which no used kidding. two of them yeah, per that front sounds rotor. Right. That's that a that different story because the next revelations I did was on the LM, and that it, car is just unbelievable. Um, so Vitesse kept rear drums. I think it's got to be the only car that I can think of with rear drums and then four pot calipers up front. Um, and got suspension mods and all the, all kinds of other stuff. And then there was an Evo version that they had to make 500 of, uh, which were the twin plenum yes. cars. It's actually not a twin plenum. It's twin throttle. There's only one plenum. Yes. Um, but that was another modification for breathing that actually didn't really seem to give any benefit to the street cars, onto the race cars. Um, and that car, those cars cleaned up. Oh, and by the way, that twin plenum, I don't know if you know this, was not only engineered and designed and engineered, but also manufactured and installed by Lotus. <laughs> Lotus did that. Lotus engineering. Lotus engineering. You got a buck, we'll do it. We'll do it. Whatever <laughs> That's you want. It's the Lotus engineering yeah, exactly. way. Um, so Lotus was involved in that car. And those, the twin plenum cars, uh, I would love to drive one. Um, well, what that tells me is that the limiting factor of horsepower in a, a Vitesse is not the intake. It was the cam. Uh, they so the twin plenum quote unquote the twin throttles were designed for L eight one or whatever there was a code for the the race cam um, and they decided at the last second that that was too aggressive for the street car so they kept the Vitesse kept the stock cam mm -hmm. I love only one in a V eight so weird so, uh, st kept the stock cam but just got a compression bump and an intake and that was enough and fuel injection. Um, and that was enough to get it to 190 horsepower versus 133 for the fuel injected U S cars. cars with cat cats. Um, but, uh, yeah. So the, so the SD one was initially quite a failure, had a rather a bad reputation. My favorite thing of, 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 to of the, the early, that. well, my favorite thing, the early reviews called it Rover's triumph. Huh. Get it? Yes. Because it was really more triumph than it was Rover and it was a yes. triumph and whatever. It was a fucking disaster. Um, uh, Margaret Thatcher was not impressed. Oh, that is, that is, I mean, we're going to have to play the video now. Yes. The new Rover represented all that had gone wrong with British manufacturing. Mrs. Thatcher wouldn't touch it with a barge pole. She made sure that the Ministry of Defence bought a dozen P5s in black so that she would never ever have to drive a Rover SD1. Okay, so I love that, like, aristocracy and the prime ministers and the and the parliament 
all drove rovers. It was just the way it was. But not SD ones. And the and the Royals drove rovers until yes, but the they SD also had comes Daimlers up. and Rolls Royces and Bentleys. Yes. But yeah. yes, it was, but it was a car that, that was a state car. Right. And then there's this fucking bitch is like, Ugh, sorry, order me a fleet of these old fucking rovers. The old rovers pre Leyland. This fucking thing. Well, part of the thing also was that she was elected in seventy nine, I believe, and she is she is um, conservative. And well, before that, she's no longer with us. Yes, so she's and I don't mean when I call her bitch. I don't mean like this bitch. I mean like this bitch. You know what I mean? Noted. Yeah. Uh, just for the record, I mean, <laughs> mean to say anything. Trying not to get canceled. Why? Well, I just I don't mean like you know. <laughs> I think it's funny. The bitch was like, no, no fucking way. Well, I'm not going to be seen dead in that pile. Well, of and shit. that car was a, that. The, was generally considered. I mean, it was British Leyland produced a lot of cars during its this period, but a lot of time what they did was they left leftover cars that would have been in production forever yeah. in production. This was one of the clean sheet and probably honestly like the best clean sheet design that happened during the British Leyland period. Mm -hmm. And so it was supposed to be like the pièce de résistance, a demonstration of modernity and collaboration. And it seemed, and it got close. It's, it got closer to success than any other British Leyland product did. Uh, and yet it fell flat on its face. And of course the, the Leyland had been run by two previous um prime ministers who were Labour Party, you know, who are more of the people. Uh, and now she's conservative. And so it's a snub to the previous party, to yeah. the other party, yeah. because this was a product of the best that the Labour Party could do, because there was a Callahan and before that there was a Harold Wilson, who were the mm -hmm. previous prime ministers. And so she's doing it not just to not say just like- just in the car, yeah. Just, yeah, not, it's, it's mostly not, to, to, it's a political statement. Right. To, it's a middle finger to to the, the other party political right. party, which had been responsible for all of the fuckery unfolding mm -hmm. at the, you know, at, at British Leyland. Little did she know, though, what was about to happen next. I mean, yes. because you think that, I mean, so, but they sold 303,000 or 300,000 of mm -hmm. these SD1s, which was quite a lot. But, 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 but the they previous, sold over a million CXs. Well, right. So there the was other that, the other fastback, fastback, which wasn't a hatchback, <laughs> which was not a hatchback. Like it looks like a hatchback. Um, and it's also everything sideways in the front of the car. Yeah. It's, I mean, you know, no, it, not, not a sporting uh, experience. That's no. Citroen. But the, the SD one's annual sales failed to reach either the triumph 2000 or the Rover T sixes. T P P six is sales, right? So it was, this was a car that was intended to replace both of them. So you, one could assume that would it, it would have its sales out, should have outsold both, both of them. them combined, and it failed to reach either one, either mm -hmm. one of them. So it was a complete sales failure um, because of the quality issues, mm -hmm. right? Everyone sort of knew they were all leaking, and it wasn't and uh, leaking water into the car, leaking right. fluids out, out of, of the, the car, car. P paint it was falling off. Interestingly panels. enough, so they were used widely as cop cars. It was police cars mm -hmm. in the UK. Um, and there were a bunch of reports done by police agencies where they were talking about reliability of different cars through the years. Um, and they would give reports back to the public about what these cars were. They were outstandingly reliable in police service. Mm -hmm. And the only reason I can think of why is because the police cars had no power locks, which always failed, no power windows, which always failed, no air con, which always failed. Um, and who cares about wind noise and water intrusion on, on a cop car? No one's sitting in the back in their, in their handcuffs going, yeah, this is moist in here. It's moist in here. <laughs> I um, believe that when the car went out of production, I think they, the police sort of hoarded them and bought a bunch of them I'm up sure and, and kept them on hand so they could keep well, they using were, them. They were fast, they were efficient, they handled Reasonably really well, priced. and they were super easy to work on because yeah. it was just a it's solid a, axle yeah. and strut yeah. up front. There was nothing special about them. Um, there were specialists about them. Specialist yes, spe division. Special division. Um, I think they were probably, yeah, they're, they're probably. Wrong type of special. Right. Well, no, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I was going to say the specialist division, but I stopped myself. And I'm I know. I said it were. in a more diplomatic way so that you wouldn't I have to do that. I don't think yours was any more diplomatic. No. Um, but uh, yeah, what it, it, to me, it's amazing that the police were like, oh, this is a spectacularly reliable car. It will hoard parts for them. And the public was like, not on my over my dead body but the um very little is in the u.s by the way okay so let's talk about this car was actually sold in the u.s um no one thinks that it was because they managed to move 1254 cars total and i think they were all shipped in within a three-month period or something so they were like oh we've that makes it in the united states rarer than the e34 m5 yes and the 500e 
and the 190 E2.316 and the 6.9. Um, yeah, I mean, it is one of the rare, and by the way, half but of rare those cars- good, necessarily. Well, but half of those cars are just body styles of additional sure. cars, right? Correct. This is just a whole car, yes, and they yes. only sold 1,200 of them, so it's a shape that no one's ever seen. Mm-hmm. Um, it does just get quite a bit of attention on the road, more so than I would have would have thought. All right, and people are like, wait, Rover? You you have to say it, frankly, land, in terms of Land Rover. Land Rover like, without the land, that's yes, what I tell everyone. Yes, um, it's the peasant Rover, it's no, the land, landed it's the gentry Rover. Rover. Over. It's an island. Um, it is a water it's a lake, rover. It's a yeah. pond. It's, it's basically a floating <laughs> piece of rust. Um, uh, but the the reception was off the charts. I mean, the reviews were crazy, right? Mm. People just, the, you know, the road testers absolutely loved it. Don Sherman reviewed it for Car and Driver, and he was like, holy shit, they finally made a great car, um, but I'm a little bit worried about the quality. So Rover's quality woes had definitely made it to the U.S. Rover pulled out in 71 for cars and 74 for trucks. Mm-hmm. Um and basically, the people who loved their rovers thought they were the best cars in the world at that point, apparently. And, but most of the people were like, fuck this. I will get anything to not have one of these shitboxes. I'll have again. a Peugeot instead. Mm, yeah. Um, but uh, <laughs> but uh, um, interestingly enough, I think it was Road and Track who was like, God, the car's a dream come true. I mean, you know, the, the reviews were genuinely off the charts. And then... I believe it was Road and Track that said, "Look, the 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 entire success of this car hangs completely on its the quality. ownership experience." Yeah. yeah, and that killed not it killed Rover once and for all. I mean, that was the end. Well, people were too suspicious. It's like Alfa Romeo trying to re-enter the U.S. market. I think with a Milano, a Milano yeah. and then once again with a 164, and then once again with a Giulia. I mean, yeah. they, it's so unbelievable that all of the original Giulias, for example, press cars that we drove, all left us stranded for dead um, when they were like, "This is our triumphant re- return to America, and we will not fall victim to our previous reputation of ill quality." And what's that? It's dead in the middle. I mean, our our first Julia Quadrifoglio test car left editor in chief Ed Lowe of Motortron when I was there in the middle of five lanes of traffic. It died oh, on the four hundred five. With he's in the middle of the traffic in rush hour and cannot move. Cannot get it in neutral. Cannot get the car to start. Cannot push it off the road. Stuck dead there for hours until they dragged it off the road. Ah, um, excellent. And they never fixed that car. By the way, never never ran again. Just went away and probably got crushed. So. But this is, Rover did exactly the same thing. It was like, you know, here's a car. This is your one chance to get it right. Don't get the quality wrong. Mm-hmm. Boom, what they get? Everything right except for the quality. Yeah. Um, so, so then what happened? They partnered up with someone who knew a thing about quality. Oh, and they fucked that up too. So yes. uh, the, the replacement for the Rover 3500 was the Rover 800 series, which yes. was literally an Acura legend. Sold in America mm-hmm. under the Sterling brand, Sterling by Rover. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the ads are hilarious. Motor Week did a ton of reviews of these cars. Um, but this was an Acura legend. It was a two and a half liter V6. Um, it was built, guess where? Well, hold on. I'll give you a hint. The uh, Acura legend was at the top of the JD Power uh, initial quality ratings as the best car in America. And I don't know if it was the best, but it was always one top couple. And Languishing right at the bottom was the Sterling 825, uh, which was a was was a hot an Acura legend built at what plant? How do you take an Acura legend and turn it into a shit pile? Build it in Essex. Solihull. Solihull. The fucking SD ones plant. They, ah. they did the same thing again. Well, and Honda had been collaborating with Rover um, since 80, 81 or something mm. like that. There was not, there's not, it's not the only rebadged Honda. There was also the Triumph uh, Acclaim, which was a rebadged Honda Civic with a sedan. With a British, uh, a Plymouth lack of acclaim. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and so there were there was the Maestro, which was also a rebadged Civic, the second generation of the. Is that how it's pronounced? It's not Maestro. I don't know. Maestro. 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 I don't know. Anyway, uh, so yeah. there was a lot of Honda and Rover collaboration during this period. But if Alas. you think about in the fifteen years from you know the prime ministers and, and royalty driving Rovers, it went from a real actual aristocratic car to a triumph in drag. Uh, with an American motor in it to mm-hmm. a fucking Honda, which yes. w- from, which was actually a compliment, an improvement. Exactly. The, except that Lucas 
did the electronics on the 825. Mm. So it was a Honda V6. Everything was Honda. The platform, it was all the, everything else was done. But Rover did the body for their cars, and they took the engine and put Lucas Electronics on it. And guess what? They all sucked. Right. So the 827 replaced it, which is when they went from the 2.5 liter to the 2.7 liter, uh, and they did a facelift on it. And then that be thus became available the 827 SLI, mm -hmm. which was the hatchback that looks basically identical to the SD1. They were clearly, they clearly styled the 800 series to look like the, the SD1. Mm -hmm. And who wouldn't? It was beautiful. Uh, but the, the 827 switched to Honda Electronics. So I had Good. friends back in the day that had A25s that left them stranded on the side of the road all the time. And a 27 they went back for more. Well, A27s were perfect. Yeah. Everything fell off. I mean, it was this gorgeous wood everywhere, beautiful leather. You hit the gas and wood pieces fell off everywhere. You just got hit in the face with headliner. And I mean, they were built like shit, but the fundamental engineering was car, onto brilliance. Yes, of it. Yes. Uh, and, and then the they did a, great. a beautiful facelift of that car in the early 90s, which was uh, the sort of run out of that car. And then BMW bought so so actually let we we left out a bit yeah. um british leyland was discontinued disbanded in 1986 and it was sold to british aerospace the goal was to keep it british and british aerospace took it over with an agreement they would not sell it for five years mm -hmm. which they didn't but in five years in one day or near <laughs> near as makes no difference uh they sold it and it got purchased by bmw right. uh, bmw got the rover group and this is why minis are bmws mm -hmm. Uh, and, today uh, and, and they had Range Rovers of that era you know Range Rover then subsequently changed hands a couple more times but B Mini is still part of mm -hmm. BMW it's the only part that BMW still has mm -hmm. uh, and they were kept trying to turn around Rover Group uh, but really couldn't uh, and it was discontinued in 2005 the name was right. just so they, axed. I read I was reading a book on BMW years ago and the whole Rover experiment was uh, BMW's way of making a front wheel drive car and I didn't realize this. They were planning on introducing a front-wheel drive car and realized that that was – somebody had a fucking brain and realized that was, you know, completely – on BMW. On BMW. Yeah, I think it was a whole segment of market they were trying to enter uh, in, in an effort to, because, you know, BMW was at the top of the world at this point. Yeah. Uh, was it Peach Rider who did this? Peach Rider. Peach Rider. Yeah. Rida. Rida? yeah. Um, um, who um, was the CEO who engineered this whole thing and said, mm -hmm. this is how we're going to increase our volume. Yeah. We're going to do it through acquisition instead of moving down market. Yeah. And then, you know, he had to resign over this whole debacle because they kept losing so much disaster. money. It was an unmitigated disaster. But if you ever want to know what a front-wheel drive BMW is like and you don't want to drive a 2 Series Grand Corolla, just go drive a Rover 75 because that's it was a front-wheel drive BMW. Um, yeah. And it was a disaster by all accounts i mean i, I think well the, initially they were very hands-off they said we were going to leave the britishness intact what the fuck would you do that <laughs> when you just got the, they didn't they buy the rover group for like a dollar 75 from uh british aerospace from british aerospace maybe i think it was effectively free mm. like it was like please get someone us. definitely bought yeah. rover for free at that po at some point i can't remember whether remember it was one. bmw the, or not but i know yeah. someone definitely did buy it for nothing, for nothing because it was such a disaster and they had all these decrepit factories and you know the 75 came out and it, people just it was a little bit like jaguar was you know it was not in step with the times it was this backwards looking you know we're gonna make this feel very british but it was like a caricature of britishness well, you know what it feels like that, what jaguar is now right i mean jaguar cars are just characters yeah, but jaguars are like modern at least is well, like it's a modern looking shape as opposed to this, oh, okay, yeah. you know, like the Rover 75 has all this chrome and leather and mm -hmm. contrasting piping and, you know, it's meant to feel British, but it's just sort of like a, a, a cartoonish I would say that every single British brand that is under the stewardship of Germans has become a caricature of what it should be. And so I, that's a really harsh statement. However, I think Bentley that is a terrible caricature of what it should be. Rolls Royce is definitely a caricature of what it should be um mini is certainly mini is i agree with mini i think all of them are i don't think what the about, germans have ever been good stewards of any other other brand i mean the bentley stuff but is look great at the l322 i mean to me that, that was fantastic if you if you hold the l322 sits in a category of itself which is a modern take on britishness that is convincing and classy and yeah. sophisticated and yep. just gorgeous that is the the one example I think, and there may be others, but that's the one that to me is like the gold standard of that being successful. And you compare that to the Rover seventy five or the Jaguar XJ, you know, mm -hmm. X three fifty XJ. Like both of those are sort of just like tragic 
parodies. Yeah. Whereas the L322, I think just was I think the Mini has become a tragic parody. Look at the The, the R53 mini, right? mini, I think, actually did a it decent did. job of that also. Yeah, but I think they had the one shot, right? That's true. If you think about it this way, right? The, the L322 and the, the original Mini were one shot, and then they sort of lo- either lost interest or lost focus or whatever, and they've just... Well, yeah, as they continue to evolve it, it's it becomes less compelling. And, and you wind up with a know. Bentley Bentega, which is yeah. a parody caricature of an Audi, a Britishism... Done in the I same thought way the Mulsanne Euros. was okay. Mulsanne was a real Bentley, yeah. as far as I'm concerned. And but actually, the Conti, emerged during the Audi era. Right. And the Conti, which also Continental was a Volkswagen Faden, was actually also pretty good. My mm-hmm. problem is now we're in the land of Bentega and Urus, and all of these brands are just caricatures of what they're supposed to be. Mm-hmm. Um, so maybe I went a little bit far on that, but I just, the best example, I mean, being able to be just completely drove a stake through the heart of Rover, and that was just it's never coming back. Yes, yes. I mean, it's gone. And uh, there, you know, it was the last British owned meaningful scale mm-hmm. manufacturer of cars. There are none really left, yeah. I guess, at this point. Um, pretty amazing. Amazing. It's the fall of the British Empire. Right. Is exactly the, yeah. the timelines match right. up more or less too. But what, that's what worries me is that in 50 years, somebody will be doing a podcast where they're talking about how the American car industry did, you know, used I mean, to be People powerful. talk about that. Like the Malaysia era was a good representation of that. And of course the arrival mm-hmm. of the imports in the eighties and yeah. how that completely forced Americans to start making decent cars, which took 20 years basically. I guess. Yeah. I, I just, I don't, think I really ever thought about how far we still have to go to get to where the British car industry, the U.S. car industry has to, to go left before it equals where the British car industry is. I mean, there is no British car industry anymore. Yeah. Or there was for a while absolutely none. And there's some British branded stuff, but nothing's British owned. Well, when, when Stellantis or, you know, when Chrysler, Ram, Dodge, all of those brands is now owned by the same people who own Opel and Fiat and Citroën, it, it, we're, we're there. General Motors is still there. Ford's still there. And thank God they're making some interesting cars. Um, but I think if it weren't for the startups, the Teslas and Lucids and Rivians, um, I'd be really scared that we would wind up in the same situation when Stellantis is 2,000 brands. And then, you know, look at the other European manufacturers. You have the other group, which is the Renault-Nissan group that owns 75 other brands. Mm-hmm. Kind of scary. Yep, it is. I mean, it's a form of consolidation. It's kind of what happened in the airplane space, not to belabor airplane or bring in unnecessary airplane references, but there's like only two companies left mm-hmm. that make airplanes in yeah. the world. You know, there used to be a lot of competitive, you know, there was there were people in the Netherlands making planes and there was a British whole British aerospace industry. Mm-hmm. That's where the Concorde came from. You know, there were a bunch of manufacturers in the United States also. Now there's just this one, but there used to be, you know, McDonnell Douglas mm-hmm. and Lockheed, like, which exist making defense products but now you have two players left that's it and it's a result of things getting expensive and And you could kind of argue that they're disasters yeah there's definitely some issues right now issues with boeing they're losing a lot of important contracts and their quality control and company culture are under what happens when you well that's what happens when you wind up fat and lazy right yeah. Which is, so it, what's better? Was it better when there was competition? Everyone was always going out of business. But mature markets tend to consolidate. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this is, this. you could argue this has been happening continuously since the product, the creation yeah. of automobiles and mm-hmm. airplanes both is that there's all these companies that all got sort of continually mm-hmm. consolidated over the course of a century. And then disrupted. Right. By, and that's where I think where we are now in the, in the, EV in the automotive space. space. Right? In the auto yeah. Space. Yeah. Fortunately. Um, so hopefully we get a disruption in the plane space so we can... Yeah, I mean, Airbus did that in the 70s. Interesting. Um, yeah, the there was a, there's a fascinating documentary on YouTube on Rover that you uh, sent me the link to. Um, it was called The Long The Goodbye. Long Goodbye. Yeah, which is... <laughs> okay. Which is just the slow yeah. strangulation. Yeah. Uh, it was interesting. It was an interesting story to see. I mean, I the, there are so many brands that were part of British Leyland that I right. think we could and do... And none of them have any sort of mainstream meaning to most people any longer, unless you're one of the sort of old timers who right. remembers all this stuff. And a lot of these products never made it to the United States, so the, all of us over here, you know, they don't have any meaning. And someone over the, over in England who's used to the sort of like, no, no, the type of person who buys a Morris is this, and the type of person who buys an Austin is that, that, those... We don't understand we don't, that. Yeah. doesn't make any sense to us because yeah. we never experienced any of that stuff. In the same time. way that they wouldn't understand the difference between, you know, Chevy, Pontiac, Olds, Buick, and... I mean, fa- frankly, no, I mean, I, Pontiac I get, but like... It was a sporty one. Yeah, so so Pontiac is sporty, Oldsmobile's innovative... What is the Oldsmobile's role? Okay, so we know we know Chevy is like every man. Chevy is entry level. Cad- mm-hmm. Cadillac, Cadillac is up top, top, right? Okay. Pontiac is a it's sporty ex- brand. Yeah. Buick was the import fighter, 
And Oldsmobile was the traditional. Buick is the import fighter. Yeah. So that only means in the 80s. But like, what if you go back to the 60s? Oh, I don't know about 60s. Yeah, I'm talking about 80s. Like, what is, a, what is a, the difference between an Oldsmobile and a Buick during that period, you know? I, I mean, just, I guess Buick had some, was was Oldsmobile traditionalist plus Pontiac Sport. I feel Wild like there was some and, excitement in, in some Oldsmobile mm. products during this. I mean, now we're just talking out of our asses because we don't know anything about all of this stuff. Just, I'm sure right. British people thinking about American cars think exactly the same thing, but, you well, know. but listen, there was I, the Buick I think Riviera, said, right. high, quite uh, there high were, design. The, there was high design stuff. There was the fireball, you know, the, the high tech stuff. Turbocharged. Tur first first yeah. ever turbocharged production yeah. engine. Which was an Oldsmobile product. Which was the Buick 215. Yes, with, but it was, the turbocharged the way, version was only... With but it's also known as a BOP engine, the Buick Oldsmobile Pontiac. Pontiac. Yeah, but Buick did it, and then Oldsmobile put one more uh, bolt per every cylinder in the... In, uh, one more head bolt per cylinder because they then turbocharged it. Mm -hmm. So that's the difference between the Oldsmobile version of the 215 and the Buick version of the 215. Now, Oldsmobile turbocharged it. Or Oldsmobile. Jetfire. Yeah, Oldsmobile turbocharged it. So they it. added the extra they bolt. They added the extra bolt. Got it. Um, so you can... Yeah, anyway, it doesn't market matter. segmentation, it, right? Long-term loyalty, and when you can when you consolidate, right. people want to maintain the individual identity of brands, which is going to be a hell of a journey at Stellantis. Yeah, I think they're going to have a hard time. Remember that th twenty years ago, there were three brands at Chrysler. There was Plymouth, Dodge, and Chrysler. Mm -hmm. And do you know what they what those three brands' missions were? Mm, Chrysler's luxurious. Yes. Uh, Plymouth is entry level yeah. and Dodge is sporty sporting. That's they're the all is, red. They had a really hard time different. You, you had a, remember the cloud cars you had yeah, like Cirrus breeze and Stratus, Stratus. Cirrus, Stratus breeze, right? Cirrus was Chrysler. Cirrus was the luxury version. Dodge Stratus was the sport version and Plymouth breeze was the entry level car. Exactly the same car, exactly the same everything. It was just that the, the most luxury options were limited to the Chrysler and the, the, the base versions were limited to Plymouth Dodge got them all with sportier styling, but no actual substantive differences. But if the market couldn't keep track of three versions of this car, what the hell is Stellantis going to do with 78 brands? Well, the problem is that with Stellantis is that they're all these disconnected brands. I mean, when they start maybe platform sharing, that's when problems are going to be manifested. Are we, is it going to get better or worse? Well, it's going to get, from a I consumer mean, standpoint, it's going to get worse. Yeah, because what the fuck is a Dodge Hornet slash Alfa Romeo Tonale? I mean, that's the same car. Yeah, yeah. You can now get an Alfa Romeo and a Dodge. These cars should not be on the same lot at the same time. Yeah. Like, I, well, I don't. Yeah. Or they they're not going to be. Well, who's going to buy one? Right? I mean, no one's going to buy when any was, Alfa Romeos. Yes. We and know when, that. when was the last time you saw a Dodge buyer looking for a 1.3 liter four cylinder? What the fuck are they doing? One four, whatever it is. Tiny. One three. I mean, okay. It's, I'm just so, as a consumer, I'm so confused and I'm being tricked in so many different directions that I don't realize these cars are all the same thing. But then I just say, you know what? I'm going to go to a company that has clarity of vision, right? I know what a Mercedes is, even though. Or Jeep. Or Jeep. Or Land Jeep, Rover. Jeep actually has pretty good identity. Jeep's great. So does Ram. So I, I'm scared for when I, everything I was reading about Leyland back in the day, all of that just makes me scared for Stellantis. I mean, we were already been scared about Stellantis and the Chrysler Group also had another near brush with death. That's another episode for another time. You should do a Revelations episode about the Chrysler K car. Yeah, but then I have to drive one. Yes, and I guess it'll be your last ever. <laughs> <laughs> My last Get life ever. insurance. Get, oh no, they're not that dangerous. <laughs> if they're stopped. If they're stopped. Um, okay. Well, thank you for um, joining us for this episode of the Car Margin Show. There's going to be a lot of inserts. We'll have fun with that. Jake is Enjoy shaking them. his head and crying. Whatever. All right. Thank you. See you next time. Bye.